We're looking at, if you have your outline, the practice of endurance. We saw that's through the defense of the gospel, through suffering trials, reproach, persecutions, through personal trials. And that's what we were dealing with, trials from without, trials from within. We were looking at the trials from without. He speaks in verses 1 to 7 of the messenger of Satan, the nature of the trial and cause of the trial we dealt with last time. The cause in verse 7, through the abundance of revelations given unto me. Now why did this necessitate God allowing a messenger of Satan called here a thorn in the flesh to buffet the apostle? Well, he tells us it's because lest I should be exalted above measure. Now, I don't know if it impresses itself upon your mind what the nature of those revelations must have been that he needed a thorn or a messenger of Satan to buffet him. But they must have been tremendous. Now, against the danger of being exalted above measure, he was given the messenger of Satan to buffet him. We've already covered what that is. That's available on tape if you haven't heard it. But against this danger, and it is a real danger, a spiritual peril in the sense that well, he could have been tempted with the kind of revelations he had to answer his critics with his revelations. You know, well, I've had special revelation. I was caught up to the third heaven. Have you ever been caught up even to the second or first? And so anyway, human nature being what it is, God knows what he's doing if he allows a thorn. And remember, that isn't sickness, but we won't get into that again tonight. Or, from the other side, Christians could attach themselves to such a person who ministered by revelation. You know, that will always draw a crowd of curiosity seekers. It has happened that way, that they would ignore all other ministers and ministries, like, well, Apollos, that he mentions, didn't have those revelations. And so it would tend toward that, either from Paul's side, he could be exalted, and that's what he says above measure, either in his own eyes or others exalt him. And so he was the object of special ridicule. We've covered it in First and Second Corinthians. They said his letters are weighty, but his bodily presence is weak, and he is not a very good speaker. His speech is contemptible, chapter 10, verse 10. And then his message from Galatians, we see this, was perverted. How would you like to have someone follow you around everywhere you ministered and then try to change the message? Well, Paul had just a part of it. It's not salvation by faith alone, but faith and works. And so because of all the revelations, he had special sufferings and persecutions, and that's what this messenger of Satan, to buffet him, no doubt was. Let's look again at the revelations and see something of the nature of them. We didn't cover that last time. The character of his unique experience. In verses 1 to 3, he speaks of visions and revelations that he has had from the Lord. Now, his unique experience is something besides that, because as we covered before last time in the book of Acts, he mentions many revelations and visions from the Lord. But here, this is not a mere vision that he's talking about, but a literal translation, either in the body or out of the body, he says he doesn't know which, into the spiritual world. Now he tells of his visions, but here he distinctly states that he was removed from the dimension of the material or physical into the spiritual dimension. Whether his body accompanied him, he doesn't know. Why? Well, if you've done any study in the area of out-of-body experiences, I'm talking now about Christians who've had them, others have had them because of accidents or surgery, their spirits leave their body. But one always appears to himself and to others as having a bodily form. That's why he didn't know whether he was in the body or not. Is because you always appear in that dimension. As I say, if you've done any research or study, and I've done a lot of it, you always appear in bodily form. And thus Paul here, when he speaks of, well, he mentions it twice, being in the body or out of the body, he said, I cannot tell. Now, he doesn't mean by that he couldn't tell that he had a bodily form, but he didn't know whether it was his body or spiritual body. If he'd just been in the spirit, he'd have known that. 
because we read in Revelation 1.10 how John said, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Then he was given many revelations in heaven or about heaven and so forth. We see in verse 4 that it indicates that the apostle, unlike some teaching today, regarded heaven, and of course as well as hell for that matter, heaven or paradise as a place, not a mere abstraction or state of the soul after death. Since he went there consciously and saw many things and then came back with a consciousness of what he saw and heard, then he knows he had been some place that rules out the idea that heaven or hell is just a figure of speech, like the Adventists, for example. Of course, they have a temporary hell where the wicked are annihilated, but some, like the Eastern religions, think of heaven as simply the soul going back to the universal soul, which you could call God if you want to. But Paul shows that where he went was a place, and in Luke 16, the rich man, as well as Lazarus, discovered the reality of paradise as well as Hades. We notice, too, in verse 2 that paradise is designated here as the third heaven. I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago, speaking of himself, in or out of the body, I don't know, only God knows. Such an one was caught up to the third heaven. Well, that must mean there's a couple others besides it. Now, Mohammed said he was caught up to the seventh heaven. Paul only got up to the third. <laughs> but anyway, the first heaven, of course, is our dimension. The second heaven would be the dimension of outer space. The third heaven would be God's dimension or God's domain, and that is a spiritual domain. The first heaven is our atmosphere where we have the rain and the clouds and airplanes can fly and you can see the birds flying. The second heaven is the outer space, which you'll never get into unless you pass through it by being caught up to the third heaven. But that's the realm or the heavens of the galaxies and the stars and, well, not the planets because they're in our galaxy. Then the third heaven is paradise or God's domain. Now, just for a matter of conjecture, theoretically, if you could travel in a spaceship through the first heaven, that is our atmosphere, and that's as far as spaceships ever get, and as far as I know will ever get. Well, I know they'll never get beyond that because recall, as we've taught you in other connections, that our galaxy alone, which includes our planets, and that's just a little speck in our galaxy, it would take you 100,000 years to get from one end of our galaxy to the other, traveling at the speed of light. That's 186,000 miles a second. Now, every second, if you could go 186,000 miles, it would take you 100,000 years just to break out of our galaxy. So even if you got into the second heavens where the stars and galaxies are, you could spend millions of years traveling there, and then you still couldn't get into the third heaven because, have you already guessed it? It's a spiritual dimension. It's already here. You can't get in there unless, you know, you have some means besides spaceships. Then in verse 4, he confirms by what he says, that one is not able to enter that domain except by permission and by supernatural enabling. He says... I was caught up, or speaking of himself in the third person, he was caught up into paradise. Caught up. Now, no one ever gets there by their own efforts, as the builders of the Tower of Babel learned. They said, let us build a tower which will reach up into the heavens. They found out when they made it as high as they could that the only time they even got in the clouds is when they had a rainy day and the clouds were low. You couldn't get there launching a spaceship because you'd die before you ever got to the second heaven, before you got out of the first heavens. And you'd never be able to find God's paradise, we said, because it's spiritual. You couldn't prove the existence of paradise in a spaceship if you could live for a million years. Like the Russian cosmonaut who went about an inch up in space in the first heavens, relatively speaking, he just went, you know, nowhere. But he came back and thought he'd prove that atheism was true. He said, I didn't see God. Well, in the first place, he never got out of the orbit of the first heaven. Second place, if he could have gotten into the second heavens, he wouldn't have lived long enough to look for the third. Thirdly, he couldn't have found it anyway because it's spiritual. Fourthly, since it's spiritual and he's physical and had a natural mind, he couldn't comprehend it if he saw it. 
That's 1 Corinthians 2.14. The natural man can't comprehend the things of the Spirit of God. They're spiritually discerned. Fifthly, he only proved what a great fool he was to say he didn't see God because, according to the Bible, the fool has said in his heart, I didn't see God. <laughs> the fool says in his heart, there is no God. And then sixthly, even if he had believed in the existence of God, he couldn't have seen him anyway because the only way into God's paradise is through John 14, 6, that door, where Jesus said, I am the way to the Father. No man comes to the Father but by me. Well, there's enough reasons why he proved himself a fool. Also in verse 4, for B, he received, he said, revelations that he couldn't talk about. He said, I heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. Or, as some translated, I heard inexpressible things that I'm not permitted to tell about. Inexpressible things. So how futile it would be to try to speculate what he heard and saw. We're given a little information, Revelation 21, 22, about some of the things he did see, but what he saw is of such a nature that he isn't trying to impart it to us. It's incapable of expression, but it's also unlawful to tell about it, he said. Now, the term here, not lawful, signifies in other passages where it's used that very fact that it's not lawful. If you want to jot down Acts 16, 21, 22, 15, Matthew 12, verses 2, 10, and 12 where the same term is used of that which is not lawful. So I suppose basically that's what we should stay with here, that he was not permitted, absolutely forbidden to speak of what he heard and saw. Now our curiosity may desire to know, but our needs do not require that we know, because these things that he calls unspeakable words were intended to remain secret. But you see... We have speakable words that are not secret, called the Bible. God has already spoken to us and shown us things. You've got 66 books here. So while you may desire to know what Paul saw and heard, you don't really need to know because you've got all here you need to know to make it into God's paradise. Then you can see what he saw and heard for yourself. If you just wait long enough. So we have here all we need to know to do the will of God, is what we're saying. When you do the will of God, you'll enter his kingdom, his heaven, and then you can see for yourself. Now, it's interesting, the institutional church that denies visions and revelations as being valid for today, I don't know what they do with Joel 2, for example, but anyway, the institutional church which denies revelation outside the Bible are that anyone could have an experience like Paul today or down through history. They would treat any, well, testimony to a vision or being caught up as many have been, I don't mean a lot, but many have been over the centuries, they treat that as suspect because, you know, there's nothing in the Bible that says you can be caught up to the third heaven. I don't know if you're aware of it, but there are a lot of people who've been caught up, and some came back and didn't tell about it, and some who've been caught up, well, down through the centuries, did tell about it. Can you think of some? Who was the first one caught up? Enoch was caught up into heaven. He didn't have to die to go to heaven. He was caught up, translated. But he didn't come back, so we don't know what he saw or heard. Can you think of one that was caught up in the Old Testament that did come back? Elijah. That's right. I heard Elijah. Elijah was caught up and came back. Matthew. were caught up and came back. Well, Elijah. But all he did was talk to Jesus about his approaching crucifixion. He didn't say, hello, Peter, James, and John. What a trip I've been on. Let me tell you about my journey, what you've got to look forward to. No, they didn't do that. Another, Lazarus, dead four days. Of course, he wasn't caught up. But anyway, he came back. We'll include those who came back. Lazarus, dead four days, came back. And there's no record that he saw or heard anything that he wanted to talk about. You know, he wouldn't have had to have been anywhere but just like a person who's unconscious because God knew he was going to bring him back. Anyway, he doesn't tell about, oh, wait till we get over to the other side. Then we're told in Matthew 27, many dead saints arose when Jesus was crucified and appeared to many of the saints, many of the Christians. 
Well, they had to be with the Lord according to the Bible because they'd been dead for centuries, a lot of them. No record they said anything. And there's Lazarus, the beggar who died but was not permitted to come back. Remember, the rich man wanted him sent back to testify to the realities in the spiritual dimension to his brothers, lest they also come to this place of torment, the rich man said. But he wasn't permitted to come back and tell, was he? And then it's interesting that Jesus, who came down from heaven, doesn't tell us anything about it. He avoided the temptation like Paul. He avoided the temptation to tell all of those glorious things. You think about that for a while. He could have really gotten an audience. He could have gotten a following of curiosity seekers that they couldn't have seated in the whole valley of Jezreel or whatever. But he doesn't tell us anything. Isn't that interesting? If you haven't figured out why, I'll tell you later. He makes a little bit of revelation over in John 14 about heaven. He said, I go away. He said, if I go, I'll come again to receive you unto myself. He said, in my Father's house are many mansions, King James, but abiding places, you know, dwelling places. That's about all he tells us. He just says there's some mansions up there, one for you, one for me. Now, he came down from heaven but never tried to describe it. So there are a lot of people who have died and come back or translated and came back and so on. So the institutional church, you know, they can use all of that to say, well, it's suspect for people to say they saw a vision of the golden streets and the pearly gates or they've been caught up to heaven. Now, while all of those instances that we looked at are seem to be valid from the standpoint of if they use those that nobody tells us anything, not even Jesus. But you see, that isn't the whole story. Because some who were caught up or some who have had visions were sent back to tell. The best example I know of, and there are many of them, that's the whole book of Revelation. We've got 22 chapters of a man who was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day, caught up and saw tremendous things, unusual things, many that are almost inexpressible in our language because we don't experience the things he talks about. Not yet, we haven't. And he has specific instructions right in the beginning of his book to write it down and to tell it. So you see, you can't just look at one side of a thing. Here's a whole book in the Bible of things seen in vision and by revelation. And certainly John was caught up because in chapter 4, it doesn't say, come up hither. But anyway, he was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And God said to write it down and show it. And then there are many, including charismatics, who temporarily died or who were caught up in the Spirit or in the body, whatever, and the Lord, they said, and I have no reason to doubt it, being charismatic, said, I'm sending you back. It's not time for you to die yet, permanently. I'm sending you back, and I want you to go tell this or that. He gives instructions what they're to preach. Or, like in one case, they're not making enough of the power of my blood. Or go tell them this or go tell them that. Then many people on their deathbeds see into heaven. At least they say they have, and that's happened in hundreds of cases. They see the Lord, they see the angels, they see the streets of gold, they see New Jerusalem, they see the blessings of heaven just before they make the transition. I'm talking about Christians. And so we have to keep a balance. There are some who came back like Elijah, one who came down, Jesus. They don't tell us anything. Lazarus doesn't tell us anything. But they are those who did. So we have to keep a balance. Now, why did Paul, in his particular case, tell us it was not lawful for him to relate these things? Well, several things. First of all, what he heard, obviously, was of such a totally different nature than what was shown, for example, to John to tell us that there was no way to tell it. It was not something to be heard or seen to tell or to talk about. No more than Jesus, when he came down, spent his time telling us what's up there. I mean, they are of such a secret, profound nature 
There's no way to communicate without giving up God's plans. And of course, as I say, some things there's not language to describe it. Have you ever heard anyone relate something, they had a vision and they're inadequate? They say, I don't know how to express it to you. I know in my spirit what it means, but there's no words to communicate it. If you haven't heard that, you haven't been charismatic over three weeks, because that's true. I've been shown things, I don't know how to relate them. I don't even know what some of them mean. But I'm not even comparing that to what Paul heard and saw. So obviously, first of all, we can say what he saw was of such a totally different nature from what John was shown that he was not permitted to tell. There are some, and many, I'm sure, profound secrets that God is not about to reveal to us while we're in the fleshly form. That brings us to another reason why Paul didn't tell, because to do so would frustrate God's purpose for us as Christians. We are called to walk by faith, not by sight. You just have to remember, here's the Son of God on earth for about 33 years and never once tries to describe the glories of heaven. He just expects you to believe him or not believe him. That's the way it is. He promises you blessings. Well, Revelation 21, 22, we get a little glimpse, but friends, that's just a drop in the bucket to what is there and the secrets, profound things that God would not tell because... Well, he's not going to give away his plans and purposes to the devil either. Another reason, if he described some of these profound things, then it would give at least some ministers a sideline message. You better believe it, because some have already got a sideline message, a lot of them, and they'd fall into the snare that Paul and Jesus avoided. Well, there are a lot of people out there that follow word of knowledge and visions and revelations and sometimes they're of God and sometimes they're not. Now, it doesn't mean that visions and revelations and out-of-body experiences should not be related unless God forbids it. But we have to keep a balance. If you find out people are following you because of your revelations, then you see God didn't intend that. The revelation should only confirm the message. You shouldn't hold back a revelation if God wants it told. That isn't what I'm saying. But I know of one minister that the Lord had to rebuke him because he was revealing things that, like Paul, didn't reveal. He was revealing things he shouldn't have revealed. And he was rebuked for that and said, now you've got a lot of carnal imitators of your ministry. That's a fact. Anytime the gifts start to operate, you'll find other people get anointed to do that in their meetings. Well, not everybody, but it just seems to be that's the way it is. They'll go out and see somebody operating the gift of the word of knowledge, and they'll go to their meeting and try to work it up. So we have to be careful that we keep a balance. Now, it doesn't mean the person couldn't be anointed. I was once. <laughs> I mean, in that sense, I saw a ministry like that, and when I came back, it was for every meeting I went to for that week, the power of God. As soon as I touched people, they would just fall on the floor, and things were happening. And some who thought, you know, it was all put on, found out it wasn't. But what I'm saying is, what I'm saying, that if God wants you to reveal something, go ahead and reveal it, because there's a place and a time for that. But some things he doesn't want told. You've heard it said before, we don't tell all we know any more than you should tell all you know. You meet someone at work or someone in your family that isn't ready for raising the dead or trusting God down to death's door for healing or whatever, why you meet them where they're at is what I'm saying. I don't tell all I know to a lot of people. But at the same time, you shouldn't be gullible and follow everyone that claims to have a vision or a revelation or heard a voice or was caught up because we've had trouble even in this church over that. They're not here now, but one who claimed to have a vision and revelation, as soon as he began to relate some of it to me, then I knew there was something wrong with what he saw, his source. One of the things that right before he left, he said that the Lord showed him in the vision that we were no longer this church to sing the old rugged cross because it's time to come down from the cross. The time of preparation is over. Now we're to go, go, go. Well, he really went, and as far as I know, was about to end up in a mental institution. 
Another person who said spirit beings, he called them angels, visited him and then wrote about it. Well, in his book, he teaches JDS. Now, I don't think God is going to make a sinner out of his son. But he said he got that revelation from angels. Well, you know about all these revelations. What about the one where the evangelist who was given gifts of healing is now building a hospital? He claims it's a revelation. Saw a 900 foot tall Jesus. Well, back to Mohammed. He said he was caught up. Paul only got to the third heaven, to the seventh heaven. You talk about people following visions and revelations. He's got millions and over the centuries has had millions following that. Caught up to the seventh heaven. Was taken before the throne of God by the angel Gabriel. And said when he drew near to God's presence, he felt an extreme cold atmosphere. Now if you've done any research at all in occultism, that is a sign invariably of the occult manifestations, like in a seance or where a house is haunted, you know, poltergeist activity, you get in a certain room or an area or a closet, it is extremely cold. Well, you see, right away I knew what the source of his vision was, plus the fact I don't know where those other four heavens come in. Paul only speaks here of three. But anyway, he was brought before the throne of God and got cold, and God reached out and touched him on the shoulder and commanded him to pray 50 times a day. 50 times a day. Now, friends, I guess you know all of the gyrations that the Mohammedans, the Islamics, go through, the bowing on their prayer rug and how long it takes. That would have consumed most of his time. That's over two times an hour to pray and however long it takes. And so Moses interceded for him and got it cut down to five times a day which is the present number of times they pray, if I remember my statistics on that. And then, of course, the women don't have too much hope in Islam, but the males, especially if they die defending their religion, they get to go to heaven and for eternity have a harem of beautiful women that serve them day and night. You say, who would believe that? Millions do. <laughs> Millions do. Why do you think they're so fanatical? They're willing to die, little 13 and 14 year olds, because they get caught up to a harem in heaven. <laughs> who would believe it? Well, millions. But who would believe these other things? I don't see how they believe denominationalism. I don't see how they believe Seventh day Adventism or Jehovah's Witnessism. I don't see how they believe the Shepherdshipism or the JDS heresy. I don't see how they believe that God heals through mutilation and pollution through medical science. I don't see a lot of things, but millions believe it and claim to be Christian. Again, another reason why Paul didn't relate what he heard is because these unique revelations may have been given to Paul as a means of divine encouragement because he, unlike anyone else in history before or since, had suffered he suffered more persecution and hardships. All you have to do is read the book of Acts, read 2 Corinthians 6, read 2 Corinthians 11. You see, no one has suffered like Paul. So because of all that, it could have been for divine encouragement. You see, these revelations were for him alone. You say, how do you get that? Because he isn't allowed to tell anybody. Who else were they for? They were for him. So that's not a far-fetched idea. I don't know. All of those are suggestions. But I don't think they're too far from probability of why he couldn't tell. Some are too secret. They're things that, friends, I dare say none of us and some less than some of us could not bear or understand or they would get in God's way. Now, don't speculate, but they're just things that where people a lot of times have God boxed in a certain way he has to work and do. And so he just keeps some things secret. Well, you're so quiet, you're speculating. Quit it. <laughs> Let's go on. But there are secrets that, as Jesus said when he left the apostles, you're not ready to bear them now. The Holy Spirit will show them to you as you're able to bear them. And there's still things that God wants to show this church that he still wants to reveal, not hide, but reveal that the church isn't ready for yet. And when we say that, maybe a few are, but there's some that are not.
And that's proven by the fact that people still leave when they find out what the faith message, deeper life, crucified life message is all about. They think they know. They've read your literature, heard a tape or two. But why do they still leave? I just told you why. It's because they're not able to bear them. They don't want to bear them. Well, God doesn't want to lose all of us, so he shows us as we're able to bear it. Now let's come to the result of his trial. We've looked at the nature of it. The result of his trial, that's in verses 8 to 10. For this thing, this messenger of Satan, thorn in the flesh, I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Remember, you contrast strength with weakness, so they translated that properly. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my weaknesses. It's the same word. They just translated weakness, so why mess up the text? Most gladly will I glory in my weaknesses that the power, you see again, weakness, power, contrasts of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in weaknesses, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, now notice he didn't say infirm or sick. When I'm weak, I'm strong. We use King James here, but do any of the versions even try to be halfway honest and translate it weakness? Anybody got a weakness translation where we've got infirmity? Somebody back there. So at least some of the versions may try to be consistent. We covered that last week, so I'm not going into it. Now, the result of his trial. First of all, we see the trial turned the apostle to the Lord for help. Now, so many run away from God in time of trial. They run to man, the arm of the flesh. If it's a physical trial, they run to the doctor. You know that. We've had them here that do that. Sit here for years, and if the trial's severe enough, doctor, are you home? I need help. God's too far away, or I'm not sure he'll do what he says. Does that shame anybody? It ought to. If it's a mental trial, that is in the realm of the mind, they'll run for counseling to the counselors, the pastor, the marriage counselors, or the psychiatrist to be analyzed. He said, for this thing I besought the Lord that it might depart from me. He took his case to the throne. Trials ought to drive you closer to God. And as I say, and I'm going to keep saying it because God wants it said, there are people still in this church that it just takes the right kind of a trial and it'll drive them away from God to the arm of the flesh. So what else can you say? Trials should take us to God and not man. That's what they're designed for. My strength is made perfect in your trial because you're going to have to depend upon me. But how is his strength revealed in delivering you, preserving you, even if you don't see any change for a while? Or like Job, you don't even know the answer till you get to chapter 42. How is his strength going to be made manifest to and through you if you don't trust him and go to him? So that isn't insignificant how that the trial turned Paul to the Lord. He was already in prayer as much as he could be. Then secondly, we see that when he prayed, he prayed with importunity, verse 8. That is with urgent persistency. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. Now he's not praying three times about the same thing where he knows the will of God. He doesn't know the will of God. So he's holding this before the Lord until the Lord shows him what to do with it. Of course, he showed him to keep it, but that comes later. He prayed three times. That isn't to be used, as some do, to justify repetitious prayer. Matthew 6 forbids that. Don't use vain repetition as the heathen religious people do. They think they're heard for their much speaking. Or Mark 11:24. when you pray, if you believe you have received, you'll have it. Well, if you believe you have received when you pray, we've heard it a thousand times here, why would you pray twice? In the sense of when you know the will of God and you're asking about it, don't keep going back asking. You can hold it before the throne, 
until God shows you what to do with it. And then we see, too, he prayed specifically. Verse 8, he says, For this I prayed. This thing. So many people pray in such generalities, and we've taught on that too, that they can't release faith. If you ask everything you ask in a general way, and you're not specific, then you'll receive nothing specific, nothing in particular. But he said, for this thing I ask the Lord. Be specific. Those people who go to doctors and, well, let's use the case of a dentist, and the dentist asks that person who goes what the need is, they don't say, well, really, doctor, I don't know where to begin. I've got so many things that I need. My husband's out of work. My children are disobedient. My oldest son's on drugs and leaving home. He's been arrested two or three times for this or that and the other. My car wouldn't start this morning. I had to hitch a ride down to your office. I've got so many physical ailments myself that I could fill a notebook. Where do you want me to start? Well, I'll tell you where he would start. He would send you off to the psychiatrist and call in the next patient who could specifically tell him what the need was. Well, you know from past experience when you went to a dentist, it didn't take long for you to specify the need, and you pointed right exactly to the spot. It's this tooth. It wasn't just teeth in general. And yet people will pray that way to God, just throwing out a lot of generalities and want him to sort it out and then meet the most pressing needs first and then on down the line. And they wonder why they don't get an answer. Well, I just told you why. That's why Jesus over in, I believe it's Mark 10, asked the blind beggar, Bartimaeus, blind Bartimaeus, he said, what do you want me to do? Why? So he could release his faith for whatever he wanted. We've covered that too. Don't assume that you know what a person wants when you start to minister to them or pray for them. As I've said before, they can be in a wheelchair and want the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They're already believing, holding fast, that God's going to bring them out of that wheelchair, or they don't have the faith for it. But they do have faith for the baptism, or whatever. So Bartimaeus could have needed food and rent money and clothing. He could have had a sick wife. You'd be surprised what people come up with. Man on crutches wants prayer for his wife, that sort of thing. So don't assume. But you have to be specific, and that's why you should ask them, what is it you want? What are you believing for? And so first of all, we see the trial drew him to the Lord in prayer. Secondly, we see the result of the trial, that God's grace turned the apostles' eyes from the trial to its higher purpose. And that's where you have to develop at Faith Assembly, that you get your eyes off the trial to find out what the purpose of it is. Often there's a higher purpose than just the trial. And, of course, you know a lot of those purposes. James 1, rejoice when you fall into trials. Why? It's working endurance in you. You can make up your list. We've taught it time and again. But so many Christians have not been taught the meaning or higher purpose of trials, and therefore they see only evil in a trial. And so that is to have limited vision in view of the admonitions to rejoice in trials, James 1, Matthew 5, 1 Peter 2 speaks of the purpose of trials, 1 Peter 4, the book of Job, you know the story. So what we see in this passage is that a trial plus God's grace, he said, my grace will be sufficient for you in this trial, Paul. You're not going to fail. The trial plus God's grace will mature us spiritually, will increase our faith, will produce spiritual values and benefits in us that there's no way to have them produced without the trial. That's just the nature of God's universe. There's no way. Well, how would you know that you're going to endure to the end on a financial trial except you had it? If every time you had a need, money just started floating down through the ceiling. 
or like leaves off of a tree if you're outside, or just appear on your car seat, and you didn't have to learn to trust God. So you may think you're blessed if you got under the faith message and right away. I was when for years I had to look at a nickel twice before I spent it, but I never was hungry. I don't owe anybody, but it was just day to day, meal to meal. Oh, I learned to trust the Lord. I learned what faith was. I praised him for that more than if he would have sent me off somewhere to college and seminary with a million dollars in my bank account. So I'm saying God can work things in us through the trial, if it's your baby about to die or you about to die, and you endure steadfast, faithfully to the end, he can work things in you that there's no way to just tell you about. I'm telling you about them, but if some of you haven't had some of those experiences yet, I trust you'll endure when you do, not if you do, because your promised trials, we must by much trial and tribulation enter the kingdom. But you'll find that you learn things you can't learn any other way. You see, a trial is one thing, to be presented with a trial, but what God is concerned about is what your response is to it. First the trial, then our response. And if we respond like Paul and say, I take pleasure then in my trials, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then I'm strong. Have you ever known what it is to be weak in these ways and other ways so that the strength of Christ can be manifest to and through you? That sometimes you know that it's only by his strength that you're still alive, still breathing while you're going through that trial. You know it's the Lord. Your faith in his word. Can you rejoice in persecutions? Can you really thank God to go through the slander and reproach and all that he went through? And some of us, we go through those things. Some of you may not know what slander by the media or reproach and persecution really is yet. But just stay with faith assembly and you'll learn. And I trust your response is verse 10, that you take pleasure in those things because when you're weak and you can't answer them, he's not going to let you. You can't take them to court, not as a Christian. Oh, I know professing ones do, but he's already shown you that in 1 Corinthians 6 and 1 Peter 2. When he was reviled, he didn't revile back and threaten. Son of God didn't threaten. He could have. Can you imagine having the knowledge that you're the Son of God? And letting people spit on you, pull your beard out, and crucify you? And all of the persecution and reproach and ridicule and hate manifested toward him? Why, he could have blasted them off the face of the earth and wouldn't even have to explain why. Because if they tried taking him to court, he'd just disappear. <laughs> but he didn't do that. And from our side... You see, Paul says, when I'm weak, then I'm strong because you have Christ's strength. And that's no contradiction to running around and saying, you know, you're strong and all of this and that, and you have the victory. That's true, too. But you're no better than the Apostle Paul, and we're going to have those experiences. So first is the trial. Secondly, how do you respond to it? Well, first of all, and there's nothing wrong with the way he responded at first, because he didn't know God's higher purpose for this. Until he learned God's higher purpose in his trial, he rightly prayed to be delivered from this messenger of Satan. Oh, I pray that the Lord delivers us from our persecutors and the slanderous media that you have to lock your gate because they just trespass all over your property. When in the office over there with the cameras running, they come on your property, your home. I turn around, I'm out on my pier in the summer eating a little lunch. They've got something aimed at me. I didn't know it was somebody shooting or, well, they were shooting, but it was a camera. And they lied to the owner of that property to get on the property, somebody else's property, so they could shoot me out on the pier so I could be on the news in Chicago. I pray for God to deliver us as a church from our persecutors and then that's just a pause. I put a comma there and I say, Lord, and bless them. Open their eyes. But until I know that I don't have to put up with the slanderous views media, then I pray God deliver me from 
them trespassing my property. But at the same time, I know this is the way that we are to go into the kingdom through tribulation, Acts 14, 22. And so until Paul learned what God's purpose was in that particular trial, he rightly asked to be delivered from it. But when he heard these words, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength will be made perfect in your weakness. That is, it will be shown to be perfect through your weakness. There's no way God's strength can be manifested if we just live on cloud nine on a bed of roses and never suffer trials or persecution. And then his response was, what ours should be. Then he said, but gladly therefore, rather glory in my weaknesses that the power of Christ may rest upon me. You notice he didn't say, but Lord, it's hindering my ministry. Our so time-consuming wrestling with these powers of darkness. Lord, it would be much easier if this or that. He didn't say that. He said, thank to go through is in a marriage. Oh, you can put up with those slanderers from the media and ridiculers at work, but watch out at home. Well, anyway, amen or not, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> a true saint, when he tries to get rid of something that God may want him to keep, at least for a while, he will, like Paul, rejoice in keeping what he wanted to get rid of if God shows him that this is the way into the kingdom. Because to take away some thorn just because it hurts would rob you of greater blessings later. Well, trials, we keep hearing about trials in the Bible. Are you maturing through yours, walking through them in victory, or losing the battle? See, there's nothing that can happen on this earth to you if you're walking in the light you've got, if you're obedient, and if it's total faith in God, there's nothing can happen on this earth that if you'll endure the trial by faith, regardless of what people say or the circumstances, that over on the other side, when God shows you the blessings that resulted from your faithfulness, it'll be worth it all. That's what faith is all about. Faith isn't saying, well, I've had all I can take. Faith isn't saying, Lord, why do I have to suffer more persecution and ridicule than most of the other church members, and I suppose I do. But I rejoice in it. Sure, that's foolishness to the church and the world, but that's what the Bible says to do. Rejoice when you're persecuted for righteousness' sake, for truth's sake, for great is your reward in heaven. I don't even think of the reward. I just think of the privilege of being counted worthy, as the apostles said, to suffer for Christ's namesake. I count it a privilege that you would even be considered a candidate for suffering for truth's sake. I count it a privilege. I don't run around with my lower lip down to my bootstraps. I praise God. I encourage you to praise God. Well, then he finishes with trials from within. Those were trials from without. And that is members are people in Corinth in the church who were his opponents. I'm not going to take time to read that. I'll just give you the rest of the verses. You can read it on your own because again and again we've seen how his opponents were causing him trouble. That's chapter 12, verse 11, and the rest of that chapter. And chapter 13, verses 4 and 10. And then next time, Lord willing, we'll have the proof of endurance. We've had the principles of endurance, the practice of endurance, 
And then, can you prove, or how do you prove, your endurance? Father, in Jesus' name, may we submit ourselves as candidates for the blessing of trials, reproaches, revilings, for Jesus' name's sake. Without any hesitation, rejoicing in what the world, including the religious world, heaps upon those who refuse to compromise, who in simple faith take literally everything from cover to cover in your holy book. We ask you to bless this word that, again, it won't be just an academic exercise. Well, we've covered First and Second Corinthians and have enjoyed it, but that it will be separated from this world and its ways. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.